I not only believe in Jesus as the Word of God presents Him, but I also believe in the church that He built. The Bible that teaches about Jesus is the same Bible that teaches about the church. As we've said often, and still the case, there are a multiplicity of people who want to claim Jesus, but they want to relegate the church to virtually worthlessness. Just something for people to virtually get together in and do as they please, thinking that God will accept whatever it is that they sincerely offer Him, regardless of what the New Testament teaches. But when you begin to look at the church, you don't just find the identifying marks of the church that lets us take the seed of the kingdom, which is the Word of God, Luke 8 11. And have the Lord's church in any generation where people are willing to receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save their souls. But we also find how Christ, who is the only head of the church, reigning at the right hand of God in heaven, wants the church to be organized. And in this morning's sermon, as well as this afternoon's sermon, the Lord willing, I would like to talk about, first of all, the eldership and its duty to the membership in this morning's sermon. And this afternoon, the membership and its duty to the eldership. It's certainly not a one-sided thing. I think over the years that I've tried to preach, work with various congregations, visited with various elders, visited with uh, numerous preachers, that there are a lot of people who really don't understand the work of elders. And I hope that we'll be able to understand more about that. Not that people here are totally ignorant of it, but if the church is organized like God wants it organized, then there will be those that we know as elders who are superintending overseeing the congregation. Now let's first of all emphasize that the unit of all work and endeavor for the Christian, as that term is defined and used in your New Testament, is a congregation in whatever geographic location it's found. As has been often, and I might say correctly stated, there is no organization for the church larger than or smaller than a congregation of God's people in any certain geographic location. It is true that Christ established one body, the church, Colossians 1 and verse 18. And to that church, when people are obedient to the gospel, God's power to save, Romans 1, 16, in being brought to belief in Christ, Romans 10, 17, having obeyed Acts 17 and 30 in repenting of their sins, Romans 10, 10, they've confessed their faith in Christ, and they're baptized for the remission of sins into Christ, Acts 2, 38, and Galatians 3 and verse 27 that they are, by Christ, added to that one body, that blood-bought church. Acts 20, 28, Acts 2, 47. But by the very nature of the case, all of the redeemed people throughout the world cannot meet together and carry on a program of work and worship in one place. As you read your New Testament, the last will and testament of the head of the church, 
Jesus Christ, who shed his blood to purchase it, who adds every saved person to it. We understand that in the first century when the New Testament was being revealed and written, that it was not done in that way because it's simply an impossibility. And it cannot be done today. When you go back to what the New Testament teaches about the church, wherever there are people who will humbly obey the gospel, the Lord adds them to the church. And they have fellowship with God. Their sins are remitted. And they begin to assemble and associate in fellowship with others who've done the same thing. Now, common sense dictates, therefore, when we talk about one congregation in a geographic location, the need for several congregations, many congregations, in fact, throughout the world, or a nation, or a state, perhaps even a city, or a town, each of these churches, according to the New Testament, is to be separate and independent of each other in their government. But they are to be bound together by a common bond of faith and in a mutual love and fellowship and cooperation in achieving common goals. Thus, once one becomes a Christian, it's imperative that we be concerned about the organization of that one body of Christ, the church. And I say, as I said a moment ago, there's no larger or smaller organized entity of the one body of Christ than a church in any geographic location. Now, our great God and his infinite wisdom has made provision for what really is a, is a simple yet very effective form of congregational government. And it's up to us if we're going to be the church that Jesus built to recognize that. Again, the New Testament is an inspired, divine, infallible pattern, not only for learning how to become a Christian, but how the church is to be functioning and working. So we see that where a church is fully organized, now mark that, fully organized, a church may exist for a time without being fully organized. And I might say, incidentally, that there's something wrong when you have a, a number of Christians existing over a period of many years, and yet no man in that church seeks to be mature enough spiritually to qualify to be an elder. That says something about people. So when you look at Philippians 1 and verse 1, you find Paul beginning his letter to the church in Philippi saying, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, you're at Philippi with the bishops and deacons. Now, you say, I don't hear anything about elders there. Well, there is no one term that applies to those we noted to be, first of all, as elders. There's several different terms that refer to the same men and the work they do in the government of the local congregation. Bishop would be one of them. Now, as people fell away from the authority of the New Testament, they made a bishop have more power than an elder or a pastor, and they gave different terminology or they used it differently and defined it differently. But we're talking about the way the Holy Spirit used it in the last will and testament of Christ and the words. We see in Acts 20 and 28, to which I've already referred, Paul, as Luke records it by inspiration, speaking to the elders of the church at Ephesus, saying, Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his blood. You'll notice that the Holy Ghost makes men 
elders. Well, people automatically read that and they'll think, you mean he directly operates from heaven without any medium and makes a man an elder? No, it doesn't say that, does it? But he does. The Holy Ghost made me a Christian. And if you're a Christian, he made you a Christian. Even as the Father and the Son made us Christians. But he doesn't do it without a rule of law, without a medium, without the perfect law of liberty, James 1, verse 25, which is the New Testament. So when I begin to look at the fact that it's the Holy Ghost through the Word of God, His sword, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Ephesians 6, 17, then He gives us the qualifications that men must meet. And if a congregation is looking to appoint elders, let's just say they're forming. Somebody came through preaching the gospel. There are several people that have obeyed the gospel. People want to be formed like God said. After all, they're faithful to Christ. He's the head. They want to be like Him. They're studying the Bible. They're rightly dividing the word of truth. They're looking at the organization of the church. And they find out, 1 Timothy 3, Titus 3, that Paul said to those two young preachers, there are certain qualifications men must meet. They begin to look out among themselves, people who may have those qualifications. And that's how they're appointed. I read in 1 Timothy 3, 2, A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, a good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. I cite that simply to show that you have the word bishop, you have the word elder, and they're all doing the same thing. You have to fall away from the pattern of truth and come years later after the first century to find that men change the meanings of those words. There are other workers I think we all realize among the membership. They're going to have to be used if people are exercising their talents as faithful Christians to do those things that spread the gospel and keep the church what it ought to be. That is, if the congregation functions as it should, as God expects, teachers, preachers, various personal workers, various things like that. But the elders, as I say again, also call bishops and then also pastors, shepherds, presbyters, overseers. Then there are those who are deacons. These are the formerly constituted officers of the congregation. Now, while the deacons are officers in the congregation, the very word diakonos means servant. They must make qualifications to be those servants. But they, too, are under the oversight of the elders as far as who has authority over them. I've said it many times over the years that the deacons, in view of the very qualifications they meet and the work they do, should be the right-hand men of the elders in so many ways in serving the church. They work then under the supervision or oversight of the elders, as do all the other members of the church. Now, there have been times in years past where people say, well, the elders have no authority but the exemplary life that they live. Let me ask something. How do you obey an exemplary life? We learn from the writer of Hebrews that uh, we're to obey them that have the rule over you. Who would that be? Well, those that are given authority. Well, we have to understand their area of authority. They have no right to write Scripture, even as you read of it when you read your New Testament. But they do have the obligation in superintending the work of the church to have the final authority in what is the most expedient way to discharge an obligation the authoritative word is put upon the church. Somebody has to. Now, if they don't, I really don't know what worth they are. The duties of the eldership then of the local congregation to the membership can be many and varied and often is. It's the duty of the eldership to the membership to, as the scripture says, to use its terminology to feed or oversee the flock. The idea of oversight is not just looking over the congregation as if you Stand and look over them. But it's the idea of superintendency. 
And we've already noticed Acts 20 and verse 28. And we want to keep that before us. So in the performance of this duty, then there are a number of things that need to be kept in mind. That's an amen. The directing of the worship. The making sure that it's kept scriptural. That it is edifying. Spiritually building up to those in it. That it's carried out decently. And in order. It has to do with uh, superintending the Bible study. I don't know whether people realize this. But that's one reason that when people are going to teach classes, they need to be people that know their Bible and know that they know it. And elders have an obligation to know what goes on in those Bible classes. I'm convinced that a great many things over the years, various churches that are erroneous can be taught in a Bible class that would never get past the pulpit. Of course, nowadays, it may get past anywhere. But I would say to all of you who are teachers or aspire to be teachers in classes or teaching at home, teaching in various classes, age classes, is simply an expedient that we said about a while ago. Church is obligated to teach the truth, but you don't teach a 16-year-old necessarily like you teach a 5-year-old. And we recognize that in every other aspect of conveying knowledge in different levels. So people have to train themselves to know how to do those things. Well, they have to be trained at least. So elders superintend the Bible studies, the classes. They should be seeing that there is a well-rounded program of biblical teaching. And that it is, as I said a moment ago, carried out under the instruction of capable, godly, faithful teachers. There's just no other way for it to be what it ought to be. Of course, it has to do, as far as elders doing things, keep the church the Lord's church and they must ever remember it is the Lord's church not their church they are selecting those who are going to be evangelists those that may be part time or full time however we want to notice it those who are engaged in whatever special efforts to teach the truth they must be apt in teaching the word themselves, both privately and publicly, according to Paul to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2. There have to be people who will make decisions with reference to the work of the congregation. They have to have their finger, for lack of a better way to put it, on the pulse of the congregation. Not as the proverbial political person is trying to test the winds, which way the wind's blowing, so they'll know which way to go. That's not the ideal. The idea is to know the differences in knowledge and growth and development, personalities and insights into those particular things, the sentiments of the membership, seeking their assistance, but with the realization that the final decision rests with them, the elders. Congregation has to be educated that way. I've seen two. I, I don't know of a congregation I've been in. There hasn't been some people that just did not want to abide by what the elders decided on a certain matter because they like it. People forget that when we're commanded of Jesus Christ in Hebrews 13 to submit, you know, submit carries with it the ideal. You may not necessarily agree with this, but they decide it and they're the ones that do the deciding. So you comply with it. You bend your will to theirs. And a lot of people just can't do that because they'll have ideas. I've heard people say, well, he gets up in the morning and puts on his britches one leg up to the other just like I do. Yeah, but you're not qualified and that person is. The other idea is that, well, every few years we need to vote on them to see whether we want them to still being elders. That's been caused problems in churches. Well, if they are qualified to begin with and appointed and they remain qualified then why shouldn't they continue to serve 
They serve on the basis of being qualified. That's the only reason. And it's God's word that they must abide by to be qualified to be elders. Now, we're not necessarily studying those qualifications right now. It's a very interesting study, especially to study the Greek words and so forth that are there, to see just as it was in those days, the first century, to see exactly what God expects of a man to serve as an elder. And women do not serve as elders. It may be politically correct or woke or whatever it is nowadays to have women up exercising dominion over men. But if it's a faithful congregation, it's not going to happen. We forget sometimes that decisions have to be made. I can give you out of my files back over 100 years ago what would happen right here in Texas. And it happened all over. It happened at what was the old Adran College which finally, after all those years, turned into, anybody ever heard of the Horned Frogs? Who wants to tell me who I'm talking about when I say the mascot, the Horned Frogs? TCU. Most people don't even know that that once started with faithful members of the church and then it degenerated with the apostasy that turned into the Christian church. Well, there was a father that ran that. We had two sons. And they decided that they wanted to move the mechanical instrument of music into the worship, but he opposed it. And they said they were going to do it anyway. So as they assembled worship in the auditorium, they had a lady to play the piano. Her name was Bertha. And the father simply said to the sons, we're not going to put up with this. And after he rose up and made his protest from the floor, the son turned to the lady and said, play on, Miss Bertha. And their father stood up and let out a faithful group who would not involve themselves in those unscriptural innovations. We forget about the fact that some of our grandparents and great-grandparents had to face those things. And so it is that if you have elders who are what the Bible says elders ought to be and doing the work elders ought to do, they're going to deal with things like that. sad part about it is that doesn't happen sometimes. And elders themselves go by the wayside. Now, if elders or an elder is disqualified, then the Bible takes care of how to do that. If you have two or three witnesses against that person, and it stands up, bringing an accusation against an elder at the mouth of two or three witnesses, and that stands up, then that's the way you remove him. There's no voting every two or three years or whatever. If he's not qualified, he's not qualified. Well, how do you prove he's not qualified? You have to show the disqualification. It's that simple. But I found out people would rather do it their way than do it the Lord's way. Directing the spending of the funds collected on the first day of the week. Now, it may surprise some people, but the funds in this church treasury doesn't belong to the elders here. It's the Lord's treasury. And that money got in there because Christians put it in there in their contribution. Now, there needs to be always teaching that says you need to be giving as you've been prospered, cheerfully and without grudging. God loves a cheerful giver. Paul even told the Corinthians, grow in this grace also. That is, grow in giving. Yes, that's true. And some people just simply don't give as they ought to give. But at the same time, elders have a responsibility as good stewards over the Lord's money, the Lord's treasury. And it must be used according to the authority of God's will for what the Lord's money ought to be used for. Well, the Lord's money can be used for anything that is authorized in the New Testament for the church to do. Whether it's benevolence, or whether it's spreading of the gospel, or the teaching of the truth to Christians to edify them. Now, there are many facets to that. 
But nevertheless, those are the three general areas authorized for the spending of the Lord's money. There have been those who have risen up many years ago, still around today, says you can't help a non-Christian benevolently out of the church treasury. Well, it's just not taught. We're taught as you therefore have opportunity to do the good to all men, especially those household of faith, Galatians 16. We're also taught in James 1 and verse 27 that pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the widows and uh, orphans and their afflictions and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Some of those brethren that divided the church many years ago and keep it divided today say, well, that belongs to the individual Christian. And they've been asked, all right, James 1.27 means that only an individual Christian can do that. So you're saying only an individual Christian can practice pure and undefiled religion? And you're saying the church collectively cannot practice pure and undefiled religion? They haven't got over that yet. There's all sorts of stuff that can be brought out about it, but they haven't. But they still divide the church over it. Now, nobody has ever said that there wasn't other ways of helping orphans. There wasn't other ways of cooperating. It wouldn't bother me at all if somebody wants to help orphans any way they want to. <laughs> they want to take up a special collection to help the orphans, that's fine. But it's when you begin to make a law God did not make that binds on us what God did not bind is wrong. It's just as wrong as loosing people from what God and His Word binds on us. I think it's interesting to note that in the first great error in the Lord's church was one of binding where God hadn't bound. You Gentiles can be saved by Christ, but you're going to have to be circumcised to keep the law. God never bound any such thing as that on an uncircumcised Gentile. The point is, God does, has never looked kindly upon those who want to legislate for Him. That's why whatsoever you do, in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. So elders have to know things, and they will by the very nature of their work, what they ought to be. They have to be informed. They have to understand what different members of the church can bring, even income, to the church. I know there are some brethren who don't want the elders to know what they give. I don't mind the Lord knowing. They just don't want the elders to know. <laughs> That's interesting. I don't know how they're going to fare on the day of judgment. But how do elders, if they're scriptural elders, qualified, doing the work of elders, how do they plan things if they can't know what to expect out of the sheep? There's all kinds of expenditures. There's current needs. There's opportunities that come up all involving financial matters. And elders have to keep their mind on those things as to what they're going to let go and what they're not. When I worked at Turley Children's Home, the people who were there before us had, they should have gone to jail, if, and they would have if it had been a state-owned operation. They spent a whole lot of money they weren't authorized to spend. They got the thing in bad shape. So when we came in there, I had to sit down every month before we went before the board with the bookkeeper and try to pay all the bills and make sure there's enough money there to pay all of them. And sometimes we had to say, well, this can slide the next month. We'll have to pay this this month to be able to do that. Sometimes that has to happen. You don't ever know. Hopefully it won't. But the ones that hold the key to that are the people that give the money. You can say all you want to. We talk about giving. We talk about giving money. That money comes out of your pocket. And when it comes to elders, they have to be wise and understand that it comes out of your pocket. And if you're giving as you ought to, you give because you love the Lord. You love His work. You want to see it grow. You want to be scriptural. You want to see people helped. You want to see the gospel spread. You want to see it defended. You want to see the brethren edified. We have to know the members. You have to keep a check on the regularity of their attendance at worship, the Bible study. 
We have to un encourage the weak members. We have to recognize who's weak and who's not, and what it means to be weak. It means to seeing the needs of the poor and the needy and the sick and so on. Our society is a lot of things that are there to take care of a lot of folks that if we live in a society like they lived in the first century, if you didn't have the church or family to help you, it wouldn't get done. So it's the duty of the eldership to watch for wolves also. False teachers, Acts 20, 29 through 31. For I know this, Paul said to the Ephesian elders, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, teaching perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Elders, when they're all doing what the Bible says they ought to do because they're qualified, they deal with one another. They have the benefits of the collective thinking of all. One elder doesn't try to run the whole show. If he does, he's disqualified. They use their collective knowledge and wisdom. It's just the way it works because it's so much in the area of the expediency. You can, you can know, let's say you're a song leader. You're there because... You're an expedient. I sometimes used to, when I was preaching on authority in the gospel meeting, I've done it here, I think. I've asked a song leader. I'll ask Jonathan. Jonathan, as a song leader, are you authorized by the New Testament to lead singing? How do you know that? Don't answer. <laughs> I'm preaching. You preach it later. <laughs> because things must be done decently in order. Somebody must decide. Well, if he's a song leader and he's authorized, who's going to sign the songs we sing? Anybody ask you to sing those songs this morning? You pick them out. Okay. But he could have asked somebody about a song. He has. And others here too. Gary has. Others at least sing. That's just part of it. Well, elders operate the same way in trying to oversee, superintend, to see that the things that God wants the church to do is done properly. In Romans 16, 17, Paul said to the church, Now I beseech you. That, that means Paul is as pictured as he's down on his knees begging them, brethren, mark them which cause divisions or offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. When somebody tells me I shouldn't avoid them and the Lord says avoid them, pardon me, but I'm going to avoid them. Uh, people don't like that, but I'm not here to please other, please other people. And you're not either. I think that's important to understand. Every member of the church, if they're truly a member of the Lord's church and faithful to Jesus, acting on his authority, aren't here to please themselves, the members of their family, or anybody else but the Lord. And if you do that, you will be what you ought to be to everybody else, including yourself. That doesn't mean you're hateful and mean. It just means it begins with you and your relationship to the Lord. You can't change the nature of the church and God be happy. You can't alter the work of the church and God be pleased with you. You can't corrupt the worship of the church and God be happy. The church is a kingdom it's ruled by an absolute monarch. His word is law. Maybe in America it's because we've had this idea of we do as we please. You don't do as you please in the Lord's church. We have to understand that even when elders in love of God and his word and the church that they're qualified to superintend, Decide in an area of expediency, this is what we're going to do. And people rise up and say, no, we're not. We don't like it because you did it that way. That is no different than fleshly Israel rebelling against Moses. And that's written there to teach us that. Thus, when elders decide that a thing is expedient, an option is chosen whereby an obligation is discharged, that becomes authoritative. 
It's not that it can't change. It may very well change as needs arise. But the obligation is never going to change because it comes by the authority of God's Word. Elders just simply must guard the congregation. They have to, above anybody, know how the Bible authorizes and how to ascertain that authority and know their limits, know what they're to do, to know their responsibility to every member that they superintend. You just simply can't change the plan of salvation or any other aspect of it. You can see that in Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 and 9. Paul just plainly said that though we are an angel from heaven preaching any other gospel to you than that which you have preached unto you, let him be accursed. American Standard says anathema, cut off. Now, that's pretty bad happening to a person. But that's what the Holy Spirit said. That ought to mean something. The eldership has a duty to the membership not to allow divisive and factious persons to ravage the flock of God. Romans 16, 17 and Titus 3 and verse 10. Titus 3, 10 reads, A man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition reject. I think I've seen more people violate that passage than about anyone I know. Contentious people just over and over again cause a stink. And nothing's done about it. But I know what the Word of God says. A man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition reject. Why? Knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth being condemned of himself. I don't see what's hard about that. I think if you find that hard and understand, you won't understand Acts 2.38 and Mark 16.16. 16. One's just about as simple as the other. So we have to have an elders leading the church in discipline where it's necessary. And that gets overlooked so much. I don't know what to say really about that other than it is overlooked very, very much. When you have unruly members, whether they're teaching false doctrine or the way they're living, whether they're tail bearers, liars, whatever. There are people who really enjoy stirring other people up. Did you know that? They don't just exist in the church. They exist in schools. They exist in any aspect of society. They're just like It's almost like they throw gasoline out and then they flip a little match over there and run back and watch it all go. And they get a big kick out of it. You say, well, how could people do that and be members of the church call them Christians? I don't know. You'll have to ask them, their father, the devil. He's the one who taught them to do that. But they're there. And God put the elders in the church to make sure that did not happen, or at least if it did, it would be taken care of. The Bible simply says in Titus 1, 10 and 11, that their mouths must be stopped. This is what the whole thing says. For there are many unruly... And vain talkers and deceivers, especially if they have circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. They got something in mind. In this case, there's some type of game, money. They're doing it. Paul says to Titus, their mouths must be stopped. The Greek word there means their mouth crammed so full they can't even wiggle their tongue. That's what ought to happen. But you'll find some people say, oh, you've got to be tender and nice and loving. You can't deal with somebody like that. I don't guess they've ever read Titus 1, 10 through 11. If they did, they didn't believe it. Those are not pleasant things. If a person's going to be an elder, they've got to realize that. There's some things, I'm glad to say not all things, there are some things that are hard, that are difficult. There are some things, I'm glad to say, we can rejoice over, be happy about. But when you're engaged in a battle, sometimes it's just not an easy thing to do, but you don't run from it. And if elders aren't the one to be the primary mouth stoppers, I don't know who it would be. Every Christian actually has a responsibility to do it, but when you consider the work of elders superintending the church, they certainly would be leaders in dealing with such members as that. Other members may become subject to discipline by walking disorderly, however that would be, living immorally, 
teaching false doctrine, on and on you could go. And so we see that it's a serious matter for people if they're going to have the church like the Lord wants it. Now, if we're just going to be a loose-knit bunch, sort of smile at heaven, then uh, there's plenty of denominations out there that let you do that. You can just go have a high hole, big good time. We accept everybody. Come as you are and act as you please. Well, that's not the church of the Lord. Not as it's pictured on the pages of your New Testament. And it read that way long before you ever heard of me. So if we're going to have the church that the Lord wants it to be, restored as he wants it to be, even in its full organization, then there's going to to be elders who meet the qualifications, who do the work of elders, and who know their responsibility to the church that they oversee. If not, I don't see use having elders. And I wish somebody that doesn't believe what I've said here today would say, why do we want elders anyway? Now you may think, well, I'm preaching that because there's something going on. No, there's not anything going on. Just Lord, let me walk back over in this room. Everybody goes like this. He's going, oh, who's in trouble now? It doesn't happen that way. Of course, if we tell you to do like this. We met with somebody not long ago. I'll pick on Stephen. He was standing there looking at the door. I said, Stephen, when we get through with them, we take care of you. Remember that, Stephen? But you ran. <laughs> <laughs> we need this talk before there is a problem. Members of the church need to know this is like they need to know about the Lord's Supper, about their contribution, about singing, about Bible study, about benevolence. They need to know all of this. They need to know the organization of the church and the duty of elders, the qualifications of them, which we'll get into later, and the work that elders have. And I'm happy to say that when I say this, uh, probably somebody said, oh, you better watch out, you better knock on wood. Where scripture will do that? Something's going to happen now. I think Ken's even afraid most of the time to brag on anybody because he thinks it's going to blow up his face next time. Well, you get that way, don't you? No, I think we have a good group of people here wanting to do right. We're at different degrees of growth and development. That's part of it. If one of these pews were full, it would be that way. But I know this, serving as an elder, which at one time in my life as a preacher, I said, I'm not going to serve as an elder. He's not going to do it. Well, I changed my mind. And so I accepted it when it was offered. That is one of those things that as you grow up and you see needs, that you do have the right to change. There's something wrong. We don't know how we grow if we don't. But I hope we'll always have the spirit of working together under the Lordship of Jesus according to his authoritative word. We'll let it settle all things and that we'll love each other and be patient with one another. Not try to exercise our will to make somebody else comply with that. That we'll know the difference between my likes and dislikes and the Lord's will that must be done. If you're not a child of God, we urge you to become one today. Obey the Lord. It's the only way to be saved. When you leave here today, don't you want to be saved from your sins and reconciled to God through Jesus Christ? Believe on him with all your heart, repent of your sins, confess your faith in him, and be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. The child of God, are you humble before him and living faithful, doing your best, growing and becoming more like Christ daily? If you haven't uh, done that, if you're caught up in some sort of sin, humble yourself, repent of it, turn back to God and ask for forgiveness. We'll pray with you and for you. And God has promised to forgive. If you're subject to the Lord's blessed invitation, we invite you to come while we stand, while we sing.